All right, greetings, guys, once again. And Apostle Charles Dallas here at HNLC Studios. We're going to get started, you know, kind of going back in here. We're not like, kind of, we're going to go back into the book of Exodus. And this is going to be our third phase. Uh, then, this particular part of this particular series, most of you know we were running multiple series uh, here at HNLC Studios. So we continue to go forth and do what God has called us to do. And the season that we're in, most of you know, we started off that particular first um, vision. Uh, the vision of the kingdom of God, time to move, is what we did with Daniel over in the second chapter. Most of us know about what happened with Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel being the man of ace at that particular time. To bring forth the word to the people in such a way that they were revealed that the plan of God is going to even work through an evil one to bring the very things they have in place them to come to full fruition. We jumped off of that particular area, uh, dealing with Daniel's vision, and we came over and we jumped over into a series dealing with the process of gossip. And most of you talked about that uh, particular area in the book of uh, dealing with just gossip alone. It's how some of the negative things can happen to us as we continue to, you know, speak things out of our mouth about individuals and people that's not quite right. We want to make sure that when we speak something, it's going to be truthful. And we got in that particular area, dealing with that particular area of, uh, I think the last time we talked about April 12th, I believe we were dealing with the process of, of selfishness. And we're going to finish out the particular part of selfishness because it's another part of that particular uh, uh, A's part series. It's an affix to A1 and 2. It's a part A1 and 2. And then it's going to be actually B part is going to finish it out. But that particular part A uh, in selfishness, one and two, is going to all be dealing with what we call selfishness. And then we're going to abominations. And then we're going to hit abominations. We're going to come down to do a slander and gossip and arrogancy and then disorder. And we're going to hit the word of God. We're going to close that out. And we're going to kind of jump back over. We've got a lot of things we're going here. We're going to jump back over in the book of uh, uh, Matthew chapter 25 and deal with the talents. And most of you kind of heard us talk about the process of the talent, the man who went on a journey over there in the book of Matthew chapter 25, beginning at that 14th verse, and he talks about the gifts that he came and handed out. It was interesting. When you look at it in the NIV version, the word of God said he came and handed out bags of gold and how the word of God declares that we're just a clay jar with a treasure that's inside of us. And that's through the power of the Holy Spirit that he's revealed through the kingdom and through the presence of the power, according to Jeremiah 1 and 5, when he designed us to do a work, it can't come from the hands of a man. It's only through the presence of the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, he may put someone in our life to help the character, but man has got the ability to give us a gift. You look at Jeremiah 1 and 5, you begin to understand and articulate just what it says. He lets you know that he's the one to put the gifts in you. And he put man in position with all these different areas of the fivefold to help the ministry to move forth. Not to make them feel better than anyone else because the Holy Spirit doesn't fluctuate and doesn't get into some of the things we get into the adolescency as men and women of God. But we know and declare by the word of God when he calls us to do a work, it's always more than what we can see. We're going to continue to just get ourselves in position uh, to get this lined up. As we go back in the area of the book of uh, of uh, uh, Exodus, at, uh, 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 actually 1 through 4, we're going to kind of recap it. And we're going to hang around that fourth, uh, run the second and fourth chapter, of uh, second and fourth verse. Just kind of hold on to that a little bit because it's got a lot of good information in there concerning some of the things that we do as being man and woman God to come forward with the vision God has given us. And it's just amazing when you get a vision. And as I said before, early in the particular series, you know, dealing with this area, we're talking about Joshua's vision. We talked about uh, a little bit about Ezekiel's vision. We talked a little bit about uh, Jeremiah's vision. And some of these things we're going to recap and go back as the Holy Spirit continues to give us more revelation and information about them. Because it's amazing how God gives visions. And it's not just to one individual to make them feel better than everybody else. And that's according to 1 Corinthians in that particular 12th chapter. You know, it's a manifest, it's a manifested spirit. And it's designed to help everyone to move forth to whatever God has put in them. It's not to be belittled in any shape, form, or fashion or put down to the point to make them feel better than anyone else. We all designed to come together to be as one. We say unity teams, all of unity. But we're going to get into this particular third part of this particular series teaching over here dealing with the area of uh, Moses' vision, time to move. And we're going to get ourselves right here, right around that. Uh, we're going to recap from actually verse 1. And we're going to come out of the King James Version. We're going to look at a little bit of the international. Um, we're going to talk about some things over in the... Uh, Probably the uh, Derby translation. We're going to switch those up a little bit. We may go add one more in there and deal with the. Uh, uh, we may deal with a little bit about that, the uh, that classic. Uh, uh, let me 
to see here. Just want to, we're going to jump in that AMPC Classic, and now we're going to, that Amplifier Classic, and we're going to see what they're talking about here. But give me a few minutes, man, and woman, God, we're going to come right back with you. We're going to get started. Down. Give my 30 minutes. We should be able to hold on, get this work done, and hear what God is saying is coming from the kingdom of God. God bless you guys. Give me a few minutes to let the music solidify itself, and I'll be right back with you guys here in just a moment. Father God, we thank you, we bless you, we honor you for this opportunity as we come before your throne. Father God, we ask you to look over us as we go forth. Father God, look over the mouth of this priest as he speak the words that may be your conduit here on earth. And Father God, let me next speak by revelation. Well, let me speak, but let me speak not by education, but by revelation that comes from the kingdom of God. Father God, let me be your conduit. And Father God, we come against every outside force to try to come against this word. We cleave the tongue of every negative spirit, every demon and every devil. And try to come and stop that which you have given your priests in this time to bring forth into the earth. And Father God, I thank you for this time as I begin to anoint my head with oil. We begin to declare the creed of the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. Be upon my life, Father God, that I no longer be myself, but it be what you call me to be. And Father God, I thank you for this time, this moment, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And Father God, as your word declare the creed according to Romans 10 and 17, that he who has an ear, well, let them hear what the Spirit of the Lord has to say. That's coming from the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. We pray, Lord. Amen. As always, we thank you guys for joining us. I don't want to sound redundant, as I said before. But we'll kind of get back in here really quick. And we're going to look over in the book of, um, we're going to, that's it. we're going to work out a few different editions. We're going to add one more in there. We're going to just add uh, another one in here. We're going to put in, uh, we've got the international version. I want to look at the living translation also. I want to kind of throw the living translation in there. Um... And yeah, let's look at the Living Translation. Oh, matter of fact, let's look at the let's look at the um, the Living Bible, the TLB. Let's look at that. I think it's more interesting. I was kind of tossed up between that one and the Derby Translation, but uh, I think this is going to do us good. Let's look over in verse uh, verse three. I mean, chapter three. As we get ourselves in position, to hear what the Word of God is speaking. It's coming from the Kingdom of God here at HNLC Studios on tonight. I pray that you guys are doing well. I know it's around most of a bedtime. <laughs> I know this for me and my wife. I usually, but you know, I'm kind of, what they say, burning the midnight oil tonight to hear what the Word of God is uh, speaking to me uh, in this particular area of Scripture. The Word of God said, Now Moses kept the flock of Jephro, um, uh, his father-in-law, and the priest of Midian, and he led the flock uh, 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 to the backside. Let's, let's look at this particular area because we're going to kind of elaborate on a little bit about that that backside just you know, under just kind of underscore that a little bit to get a, um, your colored markers get serious about the word of god get your markers get your, your pens get your pencils and be serious about what's going on here the backside of the desert and it came to the mountain of god now it's amazing when we just talk about the first part of this particular area the mountain of uh, the mountain of god of hebron it's amazing we talk about how Moses came from the palace. We talk about the process of how he came to this position. He saw some things that was taking place with one of the taskmasters on one of the slaves, and he began to actually take care of his business with that particular uh, taskmaster. And then someone saw him, they began to hide that one, told him to flee, and the word got back that Moses has actually murdered one of his own. But now we're actually going to what we call uh, one of the most powerful revelations uh, that we can ever imagine, even understand. Sometimes God takes you uh, down before he takes you up. Moses trained in the house of Pharaoh, the palace. 
He's actually a prince in the palace. And he's actually in the process of all the construction and all the things that was going on over there to build in that great city, which is called Egypt, where later on he's going to come back and tear it down with the help of the Most High God. But as we look at this particular scripture, we're going down here and we think about the process, just kind of lingering a little bit on this particular um, uh, chapter 3 and this verse 1, that God had to bring Moses from a high place. And he brought him from a high place. He had to bring him to a low place to get him to really see what the vision is that God has in store for him. So many different areas we see in the word of God to where God had to actually denounce man before he announced him. And that's the same thing in our lives. It's not so much that the enemy is coming against us. They may seem like that from the natural standpoint of view. We think about the word of God, uh, man and woman of God. We take our Bibles and uh, we go over to the book of uh, Isaiah, we're going to kind of take our time with this tonight. We're going to move through it. I'm, I promise you we're going to try to get inside the 30 minutes. Let's go to the book of Isaiah. And let's look at something over the book of Isaiah as we turn over there. And we can look at it in the King James Version International. Whatever you want to look at it in because it's all going to rule out the same with what God is speaking to us in this season that we are in. And just thinking about the process while they're over there in Isaiah, we're going to hit something else. And we're going to kind of throw that in as the Holy Spirit giving me the reverence. And this particular teaching on the night to give you more understanding about how he uses something that don't really look uh, uh, approved, approved in the eyesight of what the human standpoint of view. Most of the people bring us up because we got these, you know, the names, you know, the churches, you know, all these things that look around us to make us seem like we're something that we're not. Now, we're not saying there's nothing wrong with the house of God. It's nothing wrong with the bricks and the mortar. Sometimes God called people to bring them into those places to bring people out, to send them back out into the land, to be able to uh, cultivate the word. So in other words, we go out and we tell them, when we say cultivate the word, we talk about the process and how Paul talked to um, Paul and Apollo over in uh, 1 Corinthians. And he began to tell them that even though they minister the word of God, they're not nothing. Yeah, the Bible said the word has got to spread according to the book of Matthew 28. Go out to all the world and your job is persuade, proclaim them that Jesus Christ is now on the scene. Not just not just Jesus Christ, but the whole 66 books had a process of doing what the New Testament had to come to. We got to understand that you got to have the, the shadow before you see the original. Most of us go outside in the sun, we cast the shadow. But let's kind of get here and let's get the moving here. I don't want to drift too far off the minutes I have in the book of Isaiah. We go over to the book of Isaiah. We we'll look at the book of Isaiah, chapter um, 50, uh, 55. Let's look at Isaiah 55 here. And let's think about something in Isaiah 55 here. Go to Isaiah 55 and just kind of move down to Isaiah 55. When you look at and you see the power of God moving in this particular scripture. And the Bible talks about over here in the fourth verse. Behold, I have given to him the witness of the people, the leaders of the commanders of the people. Behold, thou shalt come a nation. Thou shalt come a nation that thou knowest not. A nation that knoweth not these shall, shall run into these because the Lord thy God Look what he says, the Lord thy God and for the and for the Holy One of Israel for has glorified thee. Now this is amazing when you talk about the process when God begins to give information concerning him. And he goes on down and he talks about the sixth verse just for sake of time, but it kind of moved us a little quick. He got the sixth verse over in the book of Isaiah 55, and he says, Seek ye first, I will just seek ye the Lord while he may be found. And that's our job. You know, why these words are coming forth, it's not just me speaking it, it's you paying attention and going along and not just reading the scripture from what you call an educational point of view. But look what he's saying, the words he used, seek ye the Lord. It's the same things go back to Matthew 6 and 33, seek ye the kingdom of God and all his righteousness. This same particular scripture talks about how you need to find the Lord while he's near. And the Bible said, let the wicked forsake. He's telling you to turn back. He's giving that, that Romans uh, 10, 8, 9. You know, talk about Abbasiti, not Abbasiti, but he talks about the process of Romans. And Romans talks about, you know, what saith thou, the word of God, you know, it's near you to send that mouth. He's giving you the opportunity to repent. And once he gets you to the point of repent, he got to understand that when God begins to do something in your life, it's going to always going to be what you it's going to be always be more than what you can see because we think about the word of god in first corinthians i know we kind of got a lot moving here and we're going to try to just kind of run through this not to the point that you can't understand it but i'm i'm building a foundation to what happened to all these different men in the bible we talk about joshua we talk about uh jeremiah we talk about ezekiel we talk about moses we talk about all these great men daniel all these all these men and women are gone and even we talk about hannah and all the women women are gone as well 
had powerful revelations of things that God done in their life before they went forth. You know, it, it, it's so amazing how God deal with them on an individual basis. And when they begin to seek out God in such a way that they looked upon him as knowing that it is as if they were the only one. And God treasured that because they knew they have an intimate relationship with Christ. When I say intimate relationship, I'm talking about spiritual intimate relationship. As the word of God talks about in the book of James, uh, chapter 5, me and my daughter got to talking about his, the other day talking about the fervent prayers, you know, fervent prayers, fervent prayers of righteous men and women. It avails. Think about the fervency, the fervent prayers, prayers that's going to come within, not from the mouth, but from the heart. And then when you say it, it's going to come out and release such a wave of power that God's going to feel it when he goes to the kingdom of God. That's when he begins to answer your blessings. And the word of God says once again, uh, here in the book of Isaiah, he said, let the wicked forsake their ways, the righteous man, uh, that thou may let him return unto the Lord. Then the Lord, stop what you're doing. Now, now God never said, uh, the word of God never said, and God being the word in truth, never said that he's going to actually condemn you once you come to your Romans 10, 8, 9. Once you confess the word of God with your mouth and believe, you're not going to do it. You're not going to stop right on the spot. There are some things you're going to continue on going, but as you continue to ask the Lord to help you, God is going to give you everything you need. And this talks about the process of any man like wisdom. Let him ask for God. Well, he talks about asking God when he said, go up in your house, shut the door, you know, pray to him in secret. God will reveal to you openly. Your, your life begins to change. You begin to transform. You begin to become that new person that you never thought you could be. Only through the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. Your relationship and your fervent prayers with him on a daily basis. Help me, Lord, because I'm not able to go through this particular trial or task. It's too much for me. It's kind of like the man of God over there in the book of Mark 9, when he talked about he had the demonic son and the Pharisees. You know, they got to come into the devils, I call them. They got to talking to him and dealing with the disciples down there. Uh, Jesus on the Mount Transfiguration, he comes down to look at the disciples, calls them an unperverse generation of people. How long should I build with you? Unbelievers. As I said before, he should have stood all of up and slapped them all like the three stooges. But instead, he began to talk to the parenting of the man. And the man began to give him a story about how his son sometimes throws himself in the fire and water, tries to drown himself. And Jesus began to tell them, if I can believe. And the man of God admitted that he had a lack of faith. He said, help my unbelief that I may believe. That even when we look at the word of God back over in the book of Isaiah and moving forward, the Bible talks about how the power of God works with you in your life. When you begin to have an intimate contact and relationship with him, to my fervent prayers, God begins to speak to you in that eighth verse of the book of Isaiah. And he talks about in the book of Isaiah, chapter 55, that eighth verse. He says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither my ways, your ways. Look who he says, said the Lord. He didn't say anything about us. See, the word of God makes it very clear. Just then at the eighth verse, you go back to the book of uh, Numbers 23, 19 to 21. He said, I am not a God, excuse me, that I shall lie. And I'm not a son of any piece of a flesh that I got to repent. Once I give a command to bless you, I can and will not reverse it. In other words, God exalt his word above his name. That's what he, he, he declares to you. Because it came that you may have life and have life more abundantly. He goes on to that ninth verse. He said, for far as the heavens are higher than the earth. Now think about this. You go back over to 1 Corinthians. You think about the power and the illumination of God's word. Illumination means an actual work taking place in your physical life. That God is going to begin to tell you some things you've never known, heard, or understood. He says over in 1 Corinthians, a particular second chapter, he says that ninth verse, he for it has been written. It's already been in place. That look here, your eyes, he's talking about the very things that's on you that has the ability to look from a natural sense. And Paul begins to say that word in such a strong way. You go over there, you look at the process. When Paul begins to speak to him, he says, he said, for, he said, for eyes have, he said, for it's been written that eyes have not seen, ears have not heard. Look what he's saying. Neither, neither has it entered into the heart. The only way it's going to enter in it is through the Holy Ghost. You've got to be saved. You've got to be filled with the precious power of the Holy Spirit to get revelation, to get the knowledge, to get the faith, to get the understanding, to know that in your life, God's plan for you, according to Jeremiah 29, 11, is really more than what you can see. For my thoughts, he says over there in the area, the eighth verse, are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways, said the Lord. He says in the ninth verse, for as far as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways. Listen to what he says. My ways higher than your ways. In other words, Galatians talked about the process of walking in the spirit. 
that you won't fulfill the lust and the desires of the flesh. The word of God declares decrees. When you think about the book of Galatians, you look at that, not forsaken Isaiah 55, but you look at the book of Galatians chapter 5. He uses one of the greatest uh, promises to you that you receive all that God has in store for you only in the book of Galatians chapter 5 if you understand the fourth verse. Well, well, let, let's look at the 14th verse, in other words. It's one, it's, the fourth verse, is, the, well, the fourth verse is a, is a powerful word also. You know, Christ has become of no effect until the ways whosoever of you are justified by the law are fallen from grace. That means if you're doing things opposite of the law of God, then you're fallen from grace. But the word of God brings a lot of things back to you. Not forsaken Isaiah 55, not forsaken the book of, uh, uh, of, of Exodus over here in the, the chapter 3. But he comes up and he tells you how you can receive all that God has in store for you if you obey that one law in Galatians 5 and 14. For all the law is fulfilled in one word. Even in this, that's what he said, thou shalt love thy brother as thyself. Coming back over here to the book of uh, Isaiah 55. Uh, let's go to Isaiah 55. Let's go to the ninth verse. For the heavens are higher than the earth. Look what he says. So are my ways higher than what your ways, my thoughts than your thoughts. For as rain come down, that I means it's a sure word that's coming from the kingdom of God. Take the same particular passage of scripture from the 8th to the 11th verse. God begins to use the very same thing over in the book of uh, um, um, uh, Numbers. Yeah, Numbers 23, 19 to 21. You know, I'm not a God that I should lie, not a son of a man that I should have to repent. I've been given a commandment. The command. As I heard the man of God, Dr. Darrell Wilson, say all the time, if you break all of God's commands, all his statutes, all his precepts, these judgments won't come upon you. When you start breaking God's covenants, look out. This is why I talk about married couples and being together. Those who actually attend in the house of God, speaking one thing out of their mouth, but demonstrating things behind closed doors. Now, this is something that God is not really proud of in my life when I did it and in your life when you did it. We all got to come to the point of a mission that we were all wrong and doing something in our life if we want God to really work fervently in us. Remember, fervent prayers produce fervent actions. Remember the process of uh, Jesus' brother, James, going down to be the chief preacher of the church of Jerusalem. He ran into Martin Luther. Don't be going down telling them people about faith with no works. Don't be going telling them about, you know, that they're about, about just faith and you got no works. Now, you can sit at home and wait for Ed McMahon to come to your door all you want. But if you don't get out there and play the clearance house giving away, I'm not trying to get you to play lottery now. Y'all, I'm just giving an illustration that if you're going to have something happen in your life, you got to move something. Yeah, you got to move something. You got to get up and you got to move something. And as you move, God will continue to move with you. The Bible says faith has an action. It's got to move. Faith doesn't stay still. It's not just going to come to you. A man who has faith has a way of action. God begins to make ways and out of no ways when he begins to deal with you. We're going down to that book of Isaiah. And we we'll look at that area, Isaiah 55, in that ninth verse. For the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. My thoughts higher than your thoughts. For as the rain come down and the snow from heaven. And look here, look here. This is, this is a typical example. Uh, Numbers 23, 19 to 21. Return not thither, but watereth the earth and make it bring forth what? Bud. See, God will blossom in your life. You allow it to enter into you. The word of God is seed. It develops the presence and the power of the illumination of the Holy Spirit for you to be moved beyond ways you never thought you can imagine a move before. Things will happen in your life. The word of God say, my, the word it says, look at it, bud, that it may give seed to the sower. Look here, if you can't sow, and this is the same thing in your life of tithing. Come on, somebody. The Bible says money solveth all things. We talk about how the word of God say money is the root of all evil. Money ain't evil. It's evil when it gets in your hands. When you don't release it like you're supposed to, if God gave you the strength to get up in the morning to go out, if you can go out and buy you a hamburger or what you, you know, whatever you're going to have, and you can't say, see, sometimes it takes sacrifice when you're fasting. Just give a simple interest here at HNLC Studios. And I'm going to tie it to that man of God, that apostle down there, Apostle Charles Ellis. And what I'm going to do during the course of the week, it takes me 5 or $10 to buy me a this, that, and the other. What I'm going to do, I'm going to take that money, I'm going to save it, and I'm going to fast. And I'm going to eat on me fruits, and I'm going to eat on me uh, grapes. 
I mean, all the things that make me feel healthy. And I'm going to see how much money I'm going to save doing all the money I usually spend at lunchtime when I'm going to lunch and I'm going to start taking my lunch with me. See, one thing about, and I don't want to get off what we talk about Moses, but the Holy Spirit moves. And I'm just, I'm just trying to give you an illustration to get you to see some things. It's, listen, there's nothing wrong. Hear me good, Wayne and Woman God. I'm not, I'm not trying to denounce anybody on fasting. But there's nothing wrong with fasting and praying. There's nothing wrong with fasting and praying. That's if you have the James 5 in you. If you're going to do it fervency, I thought who they just dig just they dig out, you eat out. You don't give no affection in what you're praying about. You just say it. Now, Lord, thank you for the food. I said, that and that's it. You just pig out. Notice what I'm saying. Well, if you're gonna make a commitment to God, anytime you open your mouth and you put his name in it, you gotta do it with fervency. When I was a young boy, my mother used to pray over the Thanksgiving dinners. And I'll tell you, I'd be hungry boy like a wolf. And she'd be having them long prayers going, on, come on, let's eat already. You know, I'd be, but see, I didn't understand that then. But now as I grew, I left those things alone, which didn't me understand. I was adolescent as a child. Same thing we talk about the book of First Corinthians and Second Corinthians. The only thing between the two chapters is the, is, the, is, the, is the two missionary journeys is the First Corinthians dealt with the immaturity. Second Corinthians dealt with the maturity. And it's the same thing in your life. As God begin to do things in your life, if you're going to become before God and you go to fast, it's not because it's a traditional thing. Oh, all the church is going on a fast. And we're all going to go on a fast. And we're going to, you know, it, 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 um, it, listen, it makes no difference how much and how long you fast. Listen to me what I'm saying. This. I don't want to hurt anybody on this. It makes no difference how much and how long you fast. Y'all, y'all understand me? Listen to me. If you don't bring the kind of faith to the table, then it don't do you no good. And so you can fast as much as you want. But if you're going to come out of fast and keep doing the same things you've been doing, then it don't do you no good. It's not about how much food you can't eat. It's how much faith you bring to the table. How much you have learned or grown during that fast that elevates yourself to the next level to see what God has in store for you. The word of God says over in this 10th verse in Isaiah 55, and I'm going to go back over here to the book of Exodus, and I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I want you to see how this all falls into fruition. He says in the 10th verse of Isaiah 55, for as the rain come down in the snow, he gives a solid word about a physical sight that you see in the heaven and return it not die. That's the power of God's word. I am not a God that I should lie, not a son of a man that I should have to repent. The commandment. I created the heavens and the earth. If I say rain, then it rain. If I say evaporate, then it evaporate. But you won't see that because God can mesmerize the mind of any individual in the process of what he's doing. And the same things we talk about, the rain that comes down, we don't see it going back. And the soul of the word of God is like rain is so a seed to the soul and bread to the eater. Moses looked at a bush, an unconsumable bush. Am I helping somebody? It was in the lonely part of a desert and in the lonely part of a desert. And, and, and I don't know if there, it was heat over there at that time, but the Bible said Moses looked and saw an unconsumable bush burning. And Moses said, I got to go do a CSI in the spirit on this thing. Cause what I'm seeing is, is ain't, ain't never heard of. I had never seen nothing like that before. The Bible says over in the second verse, the angel of the Lord appeared unto, Mo, unto him in a look here and to him in a flame of fire. Look what he did. He caught his attention by a flame of fire. Now, this is the, see, if you got a human burning, they're going to consume. But notice how powerful, how he worked through a bush. And you tell me the Holy Ghost can't work through you? If he takes some straw, some, 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 just some old, old blow, blow weed, and he, 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 this bush burns and it's been unconsumed. Some historians have said the bush burned and still had green leaves on it after the flame went out. Now, that's mesmerization right there. That's some stuff that'll dumbify you. The word of God declares in this particular scripture. We'll look over this particular uh, second verse. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him. Look at in a flame. Look, he was in it. In a flame of fire. Out of the midst of the bush. And he looked. First of all, God had to get his attention. Whenever God is about to do a vision in your life, he's going to get your attention. You may have to go through some things like Moses did in verse 1. He had to be knocked down out of the palace. to be able to go on the backside of the mountain to receive what God had in store for him. See, God is never going to deal with pride. 
The Bible talks about pride, you know, becomes a haughty heart. You know, all that comes before the fall. It's just a matter of time. This is why the word of God says in the book of Galatians, you're going to have to, even in the midst of you going through, be patient in your going, your trials. Don't get stressed out. Watch your mouth and how you talk and say things about and to people. Because you never know the very thing you say can cause you to leave here a little bit too quick before your time. Remember the word of God said, where's life and death? It's in your mouth. Who's got the ability to control that? You. Through the Holy Spirit. If I can't control my tongue, Lord, help me. Help me. That I may not speak something out of my mouth to call me to leave it too fast. Because I still got a work for you to do. The Bible said the angel appeared unto him in a flame of fire. In a flame of fire. Out of the midst of a bush. And he looked and he behold, the bush burned with fire. Hold on. And the bush was not consumed. That's going to get someone's attention. Let's look over here in a different area, in this particular area of the um, the international version. Yeah, the international version say, And that an angel appeared unto him in a flame of fire from within a bush. Notice the difference. The Bible says in the King James Version, the Bible says he appeared in the bush. And the Word of God says in the international version, he said he appeared he appeared to him to him in flame of fire from within a bush. And Moses saw it, though the bush was not on fire. The, the, the bush wasn't was the bush was the bush was no fire. No, it, it, it did not burn. It, it mesmerized him. And that, that's that's look at another angle here. An amplified version, I'll give you a little bit more deep. Look, look at the amplified version say. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked and behold, the bush burned with fire and yet was not consumed. Can I, can I, can I help you off in the L, in the LTB or the TLB? Look what the TLB says in that second verse. Suddenly an angel of Jehovah appeared to him. As a flame of fire in a bush, and when Moses saw that the bush was not, the, the bush, Moses saw, excuse me, that the bush was on fire, that it did not burn up. So that that struck him. All four of these versions is is versions of mesmerization. It all appeared the same way, and this is the same thing I got to I get to understand to tell people. See, see, many different versions, but it's all the Holy Spirit. It's all God. Many ways of interpretation. It is all God. God's word is always going to give you a point to break that you understand it. Now, this is something that was that was actually devastating to him. Because it had to be devastating for the work that God was about to do to him. So he had to mesmerize him. He had to mesmerize, mesmerize him to the point that he had to look. When God got his attention, then the vision went forth. The, the, look at the commands of the vision went forth. The Bible declared over here in the third verse, he said, Moses, I said, he said, Moses, and Moses said, uh, Moses said, he said, he said, and Moses said, I will now turn aside. Now he said, I'm a turn. I'm a turn aside and see this great sight. Why this bush is not burnt. It, 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 it's, 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 it's on fire. I want to know why this thing is burning and what's causing it. It's, it's something that anybody, you see something burning, it's, it's, it's not burning. That thing ain't burning out. It's just, it's just continuing to burn. It ain't no burnout point on it. I don't know the time of hours that Moses was up there on that mountain, but whatever time he was up there, it, the, if a tree burning that long, oh, that ain't supposed to, that ain't right. Something wrong with that. Something's not wrong with that. The, inter the international version the international version said, and Moses turned, the, 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 excuse me, so Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why this bush does not burn up. I want to know why the thing ain't burning up. He comes over and said pretty much the same thing. You look on the Amplified Version, and Moses said, I will now, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, because that's really what it was, a great sight, why this bush does not burn. So the word of God decrees and declares, it goes down to the fourth verse. 
And it says over in the fourth verse, and when the Lord saw it, he turned and he said to see, and he turned to see, God said, he called out to him. Let, let, let me just back up on this. I want to get you to see this. When he saw the bush and what type of bush and what it was doing, that got his attention. Now, ain't no voice coming out of the bush yet. But the Bible declares that God is going to speak to him from if in the bush in a voice of fire. In the fourth verse, he said, and the Lord saw, and the Lord saw that he saw, the Lord saw that he turned aside to see God, and he called unto him out of the midst of the burning, of the midst of the bush, and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. As an indication that I'm willing to do whatever you want me to do. It's not that Moses hadn't heard about God because he was hanging out with Jephro. But I'm going to look at this top of this particular area again over here. And I look at it from the area of this, um, this international version in this fourth verse. When the Lord saw that he had done, that he had gone over and looked, God, did, see, he got his attention. When he saw that he knew, okay, I'm going to go and investigate it. But now when I went and investigated, now I'm going to look upon it. And when the girl saw, the guy saw he had looked, he called unto him within, look at within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, I am here as an indication I'm at your will. Because this site is, is, a, is a paralyzing site. And can't nothing happen like this but a God. Can't nobody perform anything like this but a God. So I got to look up on this particular site. And now when I look up on the site, I get a revelation. I get a command word from God himself about what I'm about to do. The Bible says in the fifth verse, and Moses drawed unto the, draw, Moses draw not nigh un, not, not neither, but he put off his shoes off his feet because it's a place where he was on as uh, his step was holy ground. Cause so he couldn't come near it. And he said, draw, God told him, draw not near hither, put off thy shoes for off thy feet. For this place where thou standest is holy ground. It's a holy place. You can't come up in here with your shoes on. Because now God is getting ready. To, I'm, getting, I'm getting ready to reveal some things to you. I'm about to mess you up. I'm about to rearrange your brain. And have you thinking a whole different way. That's why the word of God says, my thoughts, your thoughts, my plan, your plan. That's why the word of God says over in 1 Corinthians, in that second chapter, and on that 10th verse, he said, for my ways, no, well, Isaiah 55, and Isaiah 55, 8, 9, and 10, and 11, he begins to talk about the process, how my ways, your ways, my thoughts, your thoughts. But you take it back over to the 1 Corinthians, you look at the, what Paul is saying, by how these things only can be revealed through the Spirit. We look at the 1 Corinthians, the second chapter, the ninth verse, he said, for it is written, and eyes have not seen. Moses seen something ain't nobody never seen before. Eyes have not seen and ears have not heard. Neither has it entered in the heart of any man the things that God has prepared for those who love him. Moses is about to see something because God called him. God loves him. And he's about to show him something. He's about to mesmerize him. In the Amplified Version, in the Amplified Version, AMPC, ladies and gentlemen, he said, do not come any closer. God said, take off your sandals for this place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of the father, the God of Abraham. Look how he addresses himself. First of all, then he said, I am the God of your father, your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he now knew he was in the presence and the power of God. If you go down on the Amplified verse, he said Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. I, I, you can't look at power and live. The warning has come upon you once I address to who I am. Behold, you drop your head. And you give due respect to the power of God's word. I've seen people just don't even give in the presence of God, don't even care. I've seen some people come in the house of God and their anger overtook them. And by the anger, the anger overtaking them, they have actually said spicy language to people in the church. So I had to put my religion aside, get them straight. And then come to find out, I heard rumors about them. Well, well you know, this happened. That how me know. 
You, you got to be careful how you lose your sanity because you have something in you that you hadn't quite asked God to get out of you. You can't put your religion down. Once you pick it up and once you confess it, you got to believe that the grace of God can heal you for whatever it is that's in you because God is about to do a great work in you. He had to clean Moses up. He had to get all that palace gook out of him because now he's going to send him back to the place he built to tear down and all the guys that's in the place. He's going to rip them apart. And even though uh, Dr. Pharaoh would be rebellious against the word of God, but he would still find out to the fact that he can't, he ain't no match for the power of God. He, 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 can't, he can't come against him. He found out real quick that he couldn't come against God. No matter what, but God, it's always a pleasure. I know we're going to get into the part of this. I'm kind of hanging out in uh, chapter three because a lot more information in it. But I'm doing different segments in the third verse. But uh, but it's a lot of information just in the first chapter. We know we're going down. And if you read the book of um, Exodus, you really need to read. It's a powerful book about a lot of things about your life and my life and the things that God does for us and the ways that he does it. For my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. Say the word of God. So it's always a pleasure for you guys to be with me. Father God, I thank you for this time, this moment with your people. Father God, even as we begin to leave this place, Father God, let's never leave your presence. I declare right now in the name of Jesus that even as I begin to pray for your people, Father God, that they may know and understand and realize that in their life, Father God, is always more than what they can see. Father God, mesmerize them beyond belief. Let them know and understand, Father God, that they're not some kind of fly of horses that's passing through life. Whatever they have committed in their life that wasn't right, Father God, you're giving them an opportunity every morning to say, Father, forgive me that I may walk and receive a place in your, in your kingdom when I leave here. And Father God, I'm asking you to strengthen the years of the individuals, Father God, whatever it may be, those going through sicknesses, those who have had pain and hurt in their body, Father God, heal them and let them know, Father God, that everybody's got a turn, everybody's got a time. But how you do your work while you're here on earth reveals a whole lot to what God is going to take you when you leave here. Father, I declare the decree in the name of Jesus that you touch them, Father God, with the grace and the mercy, the authority and the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. Touch the woman of God. Touch the man of God. Touch your children as you declare in your words, suffer every one of them to come unto me. Forbid them not as such in the kingdom of God. Look over all our teenagers, our new generation. Father, I shape them, mold them, make them what you designed and engineered them to be. Put the word of God in them powerfully. That you begin to declare that the old man will dream dreams, but they will continue to prophesy and bring forth the word in the season that we had never thought or known and understood. Father God, raise them up. Touch them, Father God. Go into every household. Move, Father God, up and down and all around. Convict and arrest. Shut down every negative thing in their life that's not like God. I decree and declare that even you send your angels over to the hospital. Those who are prepared for surgery, those who have had post surgeries. And Father God, I declare right now that you will do a supernatural thing in their life. Let the words that proceed to go forth, Father God, that they will not come back void. But they have already accomplished and done all that they're in. Father God, help them to believe in the midst of their unbelief. Then unto you, Father God, that everything, everything has already been made possible because of what you've done on the cross. We decree it, we declare it. We speak it. We call it already done because it's your word. Am I God that I shall lie or am I son of any man that I shall repent? Lord, you gave a commandment in the mighty name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. We decree and declare and we call it done. 